Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of In the Round, Discussions About Theater. This is a weekly talk show where we bring in uh, different creatives, leaders in the community to talk about various topics relating to one of our favorite things in life, theater. And this week, we're going to be exploring the all-important topic of arts education, specifically theater education. I have an amazing panel of guests with me tonight. We were cracking each other up in the green room, so we are in for a fabulous show. I'm your host, Christopher Daniels. I'm the executive director of Good Luck Macbeth Theater. And with me this fine May Day spring evening is Rod Hearn, who is a drama teacher at Damani Ranch High School. Thanks for being here, Rod. I'm glad to be here. We also are joined by our fabulous regular Mary Bennett, who is the producing artistic director of Bruca Theater and is also an arts integration specialist for Sierra Arts Foundation. Hello, Mary. Hello, Christopher. <laughs> My fellow ginger in crime and passion. I love it. <laughs> And then, of course, we have Joe Atak, who is the producing artistic director of Good Luck Macbeth Theater and is also the education director for Lake Tahoe Shakespeare Festival. How are you, Joe? I'm well, thank you. Nice to see everyone. And then last but certainly not least, we have LaRonda Etheridge, who's the education coordinator for Reno Little Theater. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, Christopher. Ooh, oh, and I love that. I love the emphasis on my on the full name. It's so great. Um, well, thank you for all being here. And of course, I uh, want to give a huge shout out to our uh, technical director, Derek Nance, who is the man behind the curtain who keeps us all streaming and fabulous and wonderful. Thank you, Derek. We literally would not be here without you. So appreciate all of your efforts. Now, for today's theme, we're going to discuss theater education and uh, arts in education is a very relevant topic. It's often in the news about whether funding of the arts, especially within schools, the benefits of having a really strong and robust uh, arts education program within your schools. And so just to start out, I think many of us know that the arts are a necessity for a rich culture and for a vibrant community. And we know from research that theater education has really immense benefits for students. Um, it can be anything from improved academic performance to improved retention rates, um, attendance, behavior. Uh, but what I want um, us to talk about first is what are the things that you believe our viewers at home might not know about in terms of the benefits of theater education. What have you seen in your particular arenas in your fields um, that students have gained by uh, participating in theater, the skills that they've gained, how they have transformed and changed? And Rod, I want to start with you. Um, in a high school capacity, you know, you're working with students on the daily. What have you noticed in your students who uh, participate in your theater program. Uh, thanks, Chris. I, I, first of all, I think the number one reason that theater education is helpful in a high school is because it's an opportunity for them to practice empathy in a lot of different um, circumstances. Um, it's no secret that we have a generation of young people through no fault of their own are living through phones and having connection through phones instead of figuring out how to navigate the really complex nuances of interpersonal relationships that are between two living, breathing people in the same room. And I think that's really something that has sort of slipped off the radar when um, school districts and states look at funding for arts programs, especially in theater education, they aren't necessarily looking at, out of everything offered in a high school, what are, what are those things that are going to help kids learn how to be human beings with each other in this world. And I think it's really important that through theater education, they get a practice um, working with each other and build up that skill set. So it's not just through technology. I love that. And it's, 
empathy not just in collaboration and co-creation but also do you find that they derive empathy from seeing different people's stories and experiences through the plays and musicals that you're putting on they sort of get a a view into another's world and what they're going through i think for sure i think the spine of a lot of good theater is vicarious experience and um you know we'll go and watch something happen on stage that we would never ever want to be a part of in real life but we learn and we grow from it you know there's a lot of classic drama that i would steer clear of but i'll love to sit in the audience and watch it unfold in front of me and think how would i react if i were in their shoes and what would i do and who do i identify with up on there on the stage so whether it's in person or just an exercise or as an audience member watching their peers perform in class or in you know a fully produced, uh, realized production, I think all of it kind of blends into building a greater understanding of, of what it means to be human and the human condition and to work and communicate together. I love that. Mary, same question. What have you found um, in your work, not just with Bruca, but with Sierra Arts Foundation, what have you found uh, students are gaining from having theater as a regular part of their um, school experience? I, well, I agree with Rod. It, it brought up a lot of things, thinking about um, either being able to watch or be part of as a character, if you get to play the character, coming out the other side of something. Um, of course, being in someone else's shoes, you know, it makes me think of stories like Anne Frank, historical stories that I think are so important to continue to tell and embrace. Um, and some of them don't turn out very well, do they, Rod, as you've pointed out, and all of us know that. But one of the things that I think is so interesting is um, when you get to go into a classroom or when you get to work with a, a new group of people, whether it's kids, adults, um, and when you use improvisation and you use a, yes and that a theory and you start doing storytelling, just really basic storytelling with groups. And all of a sudden people get beyond the wanting to make everything correct. And it's the opportunity to make a mistake and come out the other side of a mistake. And sometimes it might end, you know, it might, thank you very much. That story has ended and, and I'm done, but I'm still alive and we're still having a good time. So we learn by, you know, maybe not having a success, but um, it's not necessarily a failure, but we've stopped. But in seeing how stories can move forward by uh, not only saying yes yourself, but by working with a group of people that collaborate and say yes, kind of like this, what we're doing right now, um, is so exciting and mind blowing. And like you said at the beginning, Chris, sometimes when you go into a school, I think when I was very young, I'd go in and think everybody's going to be a Broadway star, you know, and then to realize, I think the reason that we go into a classroom or a community as theater artists is, you know, I do want everybody to feel like a star, but I also want people to get the ability of confidence in telling a story and their own voice and that their own piece is as important as someone else's. We all, you know, play a spoke in this wheel. So it's the yes and, it's that storytelling and that magic of collaboration that um, I think is so helpful for students and um, anybody who's wanting to dig deep and dunk their feet into the arts and um, I, I just love it. I love that answer so much. It was something um, I would tell my students when I would go into the classroom is that, um, especially in theater, there's no such thing as right or wrong choices um because they're your choices and they came from somewhere and they're adding to the picture and creating something that's unique and in the moment and a reflection of what's happening within the space and i think it opens the door for that self-expression um right which is so and important the, and so beautiful the space is important too because chris and i have gotten to teach together and uh, we've all actually i don't want to brag but i love working with all the people in these squares uh, but uh, when you get to tell the kids, it's like, okay, so there's some rules. So if we're at a school, it's not a cabaret. So some of the stuff you've been working on at home might not be appropriate for what we're going to do here. 
<laughs> but uh, right, so we get to learn that lesson. So it's yes and, but. <laughs> with, with some caveats, with some caveats. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I love it. <laughs> what about you, Loranda? And you know, I have to say, you know, RLT has such an amazing education program, so many different offerings um, that span a, a wide age range. Um, so just phenomenal work uh oh, that renal little theater is doing in the realm of theater education what have you found um in in working with your kids the the things that they're gaining and benefiting from by participating in the programs well first off thank you for those lovely words um that's very nice to hear um tying in a little bit to what both Mary and you, Chris, were talking about, because I have gone into classrooms as well. And what I have found <laughs> is I prefer what I do because at least the kids that come to me want to be there. <laughs> so one of the challenges I find in a classroom is that not all of them want to be doing what it is you're doing. So, um, so I have the benefit of if they're there, it's because they want to do theater or they want to be there. Um, but one of the biggest things that I find, because I get them really little and then I, you know, all the way up to teenagers, but um, with the really little ones, a lot of times the reason why their parent has signed them up is because they do want to stand out and be the center of attention all the time. And so bringing them into um, a theater education environment, um, I love watching them learn that, oh, they don't have to be the center of attention all the time, that they are, you know, one spoke on the wheel, like Mary was saying, and um, just figuring out that discipline of, yes, they can express themselves, but there's a time um, to do that. And the biggest thing that I try to uh, instill right off the get go with the like five and six year olds is that listening is actually more important than being the center of attention. So that's what we focus on right off the bat is learning when to listen and then when to get to be the center of attention. Mm. So that's that's my biggest thing. <laughs> I love that. And I think it ties so well into what Rod was talking about. You know, empathic practices are so heavily rooted in listening, um, mm -hmm. you know, not only to your scene partners, um, but really what's going around, what's happening around you as well. So I love that that's a core uh, practice and belief for you. Um, Joe, something we were talking about um off the record off the show um because you go into schools and and use shakespeare as the medium um by which you're teaching but often when you're teaching shakespeare you're teaching something else as well and just sort of using shakespeare as the platform by which to impart um different messages so could you speak a little to that work sure I can. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Um, so we we have a lot of people don't actually know this, but um, Lake Tahoe Shakespeare has two education programs, has a summertime program that we can talk about maybe at, at another point. We have an in-school residency program, which is called Interact. And we work with a lot of students in this region between five and six thousand a year. And we do different kinds of it's not really a cookie cutter type of thing because we do something slightly different with as rod could tell you because i've been in his classroom uh occasionally um is that we do different things with different classes so we do a lot of ela work which is shakespeare in the classroom talking about language and the language arts and that's different for different things we do a lot of confidence work with young kids now that's a lot sort of piggybacking off what Rod was talking about in terms of empathy. We do a lot of work with the very young elementary school children now about making eye contact and speaking clearly and body language and self-expression and ability to take compliments and to speak confidently. 
Um, but we also do, of course, a lot of Shakespeare and a lot of acting stuff. I think one of the things that we, one of the things that I think students get a lot from the work we do, but also the work in general of, of a theater artist is, is a lot of what LaRonda, Mary and Rod spoke to. And I think it's also about this, it, it's about learning empathy and it's also about learning about yourself. It's also about learning that choices are choices. We all make choices every day when everything that we do, and those choices also have consequences, not just for ourselves, but for other people. And it's about learning about the interconnectivity of your own choices and what that means for somebody else. And, and also taking that, like, all, as you were saying, one of the things we do with Shakespeare a lot because there are so many universal themes in Shakespeare's work, of course, but actually he addresses so many social, socio-political uh, ideas, ideas about gender and sex and race, that it really, I think one of the great gifts of theater in general is, is it gives you a symposium, a platform and an opportunity to discuss really complicated topics in a way that's free freer from getting into the weeds of something that um, that can cause conflict in an interpersonal way. So you can really examine issues uh, of uh, gender or, or sexual orientation or race, and you can take away the personal element of it that I believe this and you can look at say Shakespeare and say in Shakespeare's time they thought about gender in this way or depending on how old your students are um, you can tackle really perhaps difficult areas like you could talk about what does it mean what did what did people think in terms of race what did people and where are we now and what does that mean for us as artists what reflection does this say uh, about us and our time. One of the great conversations I love to have with older students is to think about um, the very uh, white European centricness of the way we think about theater and how we talk a lot about what theater is, but a lot of our view is really skewed by the fact that we think of Shakespeare as like a you know, a, a very big touchstone, or we think of, we, you know, Chekhov, or, you know, our instant sort of go-tos a lot of the time in theater are really European, white European centric. Mm -hmm. And I think if you go back and look at something like Shakespeare or Oscar Wilde, or any of those things that come from a certain time period, you, it gives you an opportunity to start to open up those conversations as well and say, what does it, why, why are these things important to us as a society? And why are there, what is missing when we look at these things? What is really obviously the gap in the things that we're looking at? If we're looking at Shakespeare, we're looking at Oscar Wilde, we're looking at Chekhov, we're talking about Stanislavski, where is the, African theater? Where is the Asian theater? Where is the Spanish theater? Where is the, you know, why is there a gap there? And what does it mean to, we work with a really diverse population of students across as much as there is across this county, you know, um, the counties, I should say. And so I think it's really, it, the thing that I think students get the opportunity to think about is themselves in the world, but also how, how they're they may, we may, you may only be an individual, but you can have a really large rippling impact in everything that you do and the choices you make. Hmm. That was a very wide ranging outcome. answer. That was huge. <laughs> but Joe, it's like that the outcome of that is so great when you can get a community that starts to understand some of the characteristics of the characters. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of how you teach it, and I think you guys do all these uh incredible things 
Um, but there's, you know, there's so many ways to get through Shakespeare, whether it's through, you know, they've put together these wonderful Shakespeare graphic novels now for kids and all sorts of different ways of addressing it. And um, I remember we had done a, a summer camp years ago and we had talked about Othello. We were doing Othello and I had talked about Iago and how, you know, just kind of what a jerk he is, you know, and just always throwing under everybody else under the bus and stuff. And I remember one of the little kids said we were in this camp and he turned to another kid and he said don't be an Iago <laughs> I'm like oh, our work here is done <laughs> <laughs> that is a very important life lesson actually don't be Iago <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that is great so with that all in mind, um, you know, recognizing that you're working with diverse populations, different age ranges, different experiences, how do you begin to create um, a curriculum? You know, how do you begin to take all of these things that you want to do, all these goals that you wish to accomplish and and working with different students who are in different places, not only um, experience wise with theater, but also um, are, are maybe seeking different things from the theatrical experience. So how do you begin, um, you know, Rod, I want to start with you. How do you even begin to, you know, draft a curriculum with all these different things in mind? Where do you start and what are you thinking about when you're putting a program together? Uh, there is a, there's a core arts curriculum that is adopted in the state of Nevada that is a nationwide um, set of standards. And so I start with that. Um, but that doesn't readily always translate to every single kid because you, you just teach the kid you have in the room and wherever, wherever they are, that's where you start. And some kids are really go getters and they're eager to, to learn everything you can. And some have kind of a wall up and they're not really sure they love being there yet. Um, some love being there, but they have zero skills. You know, they're really just at a, a skill building level and it's difficult for them to talk about bigger issues having to do with theater and performance. So we start with standards and build units and lessons about that. But to complement that, there's always the performance side of things. And um, it, I, always in one of my big performances of the year is a sort of mixed class of intermediate and advanced kids. And it, it has never been that all of the intermediate kids are down here and all of the advanced kids are up here. There's not that they're all kind of all over the place. And we all start kind of down here and we learn and you just see them improve and improve and they get better and better. And then performance comes and what you want the audience to see is often way up here. And many times the kids are not quite there yet. And so part of what I struggle with is the kids have to have live people come in and watch them. Otherwise they don't feel the pressure that kind of helps them be the best version of themselves they can be. And so you bring people in and you know full well that some kids are really raring to go and they're ready and other kids are just as good as they can be right now. And one of the things that I remind myself of is I'm just a really poor predictor of looking at a freshman student and trying to figure out, is, is that kid going to be a star in four years? I am not really astute at that uh, because it doesn't take into account the kid's own interest and drive and desire to improve because some kids might be really great and stellar in ninth grade and that's kind of where they stay for four years like their mentality is that they've already arrived and they don't improve sometimes but there are other kids who come in in ninth grade and their skill set is really sort of rock bottom you know they just had zero experience with this and they just eat it up and they grow and they they become marvelous by the time they're seniors so it's always really surprising to see where kids go. So I also try to program, going back to the performances, lots of really different sorts of shows, different genres, different types of theatrical conceits and give kids just the widest variety that they can have over four years. So if they keep doing shows with me over and over again, they're not gonna come back and do a 1930s comedy again and again and again, just because those are generally really safe. Um, in a school environment um, doesn't mean that's what we can just do all the time. So I do try to mix it up, you know, in terms of content for shows as well. 
Uh, quick question. How difficult is it since you brought it up, finding programs and finding shows that are um, acceptable within a school environment, but that also are speaking to your students as well? Do you find that challenging? I do. It's actually one of my favorite parts of my job is reading scripts and trying to figure out what am I going to do next year? That's very exciting work for me. And occasionally I find a script I really love and I think this is entirely inappropriate for my school environment. So <laughs> I'm going to send it over to Good Luck Macbeth or Luca <laughs> Theater or Luca Little Theater. All of you have gotten scripts that I've sent your way because I read them and I think this is not really for me here right now. Um, but I, I really so enjoy reading scripts um, that that part of my job is really exciting. So I just read and read and read. <laughs> and we appreciate that so much because there is so much out yes. there. We, re we really do, you know, give you a shout out on the album. You know, it's, um, <laughs> it's always nice to have, you know, um, different perspectives and creative folks who see something and, and to read something and say, this feels so on brand or in line with your theater and the work that you're doing um, is amazing. So thank you. Keep sending them. Uh, we'll keep reading them. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, Raj, you brought up and I want to, you know, throw it to the group, maybe Mary starting with you is um, there are challenges um, that I think teaching artists and, and individuals who are uh, theater education directors and coordinators come across, especially when you have students who are not responsive or have walls up to the work that you're trying to do. So what's a tactic that you found or a strategy that you employ to help bring some of those barriers down to open students up to the work that you're hoping to do? Uh, you know, I think there's some real basics. Um, I think to not be too tall, which is a weird thing, but like if you're working with really little children, um, little in height, um, to get to their height so that you're not dominating over the top of them and looking them in the eye, what Joe was saying, you know, we want people to feel confident and look each other in the eye. I think if we start by doing that, that helps a lot. Uh, slowing down, uh, taking time to make sure that you're not only communicating, but you're also listening. Like what LaRonda was talking about teaching, which I just love. Um, we have to listen back as well, which is sometimes difficult in a time crunch because we're given lots of times in the classes that we're teaching just a certain amount of time and we're really trying to get a lot in there. And so one of the big challenges is to take that breath and, and uh, listen. And then I, I think another thing, you know, there's, there's been some times that we've gone into a classroom, whether it's performance, uh, we do our theater for children through Bruca. So we tour to um, uh, schools and libraries throughout the year, we take a show in and we'll perform for, you know, 300 kids and then uh, the smaller kids K through three, and then they'll bring in the, the older kids, the four through six. And so one of the challenges is trying to play to your audience so that we're not talking down, um, that we're continuing to engage in the moment and uh, presenting the material freshly, even though it's a, it's a show that we've put together, the original shows. But um, for example, last year we did Galileo and um, I really wanted to present the story of Galileo. I felt like it really matched the curriculum of um, the science that we're trying to share with the kids. We're learning about the planets. I tried to keep it simple, but bring in the fact that Galileo really had to stand up for what he believed in and, and he was really up against a lot and uh, what he what he put up with. And, and so I was trying to kind of flesh through this and finally it was realizing that it needed to be through the eyes of his children. And I had read a book actually in a school residency uh, years ago um, called Galileo's Daughter. And it's a very simple book, beautifully drawn and written where his daughter finds the colored glass that he used to look through his telescope 
uh, and to be able to see the night sky. And um, so that was a real starting point in being able to do this play. And I think by trying to understand that it's hard when we're presenting things to children as adults and expecting them to understand the breadth of this whole lifetime. But if we're able to start to understand um, coming to it from a place that, that they exist, uh, it felt really successful. And I think that the kids really enjoyed it. And I usually, I have a tendency to kind of fall into patterns in terms of writing and, and uh, structuring things for kids. And that was a real breakaway in terms of uh, presenting to a large amount of kids a play that had humor in it, but was serious and uh, dealt with some intense themes. He left his children and said goodbye to them and continued his relationship with them through letters and wondering if that was going to fit into the play and how that would be presented. It worked out really beautifully. And we get the opportunity to, uh, when we first put the shows up to uh, be able to present them at Bruca in a small uh, audience and see what works and what doesn't. And we continue through the tour to be able to fix things, which is really nice um, because they are original pieces that are coming from us and trying to deal with things that are in the present moment. But it could be something from the 1600s, you know, just like you're doing with Shakespeare, Joe. You know, it's it's there are some big themes within a, a long time span of history that we can continue to bring out in the kids and it's how we approach it. And so I think the biggest challenge is trying to understand where other people are coming from and, and how it's going to affect them. And the last one, God, I could talk and I'm so sorry. Uh, but the last one, is, <laughs> uh, we've gone into a lot of schools where, um, there's language barriers. And, you know, Joe went back and, and talked a lot about, you know, there's this European uh, sort of white feeling to a lot of the theater that we do, because that is generally who we are, if we're going to look at our DNA. And we all yearn to be able to tell the stories of our world and our different cultures. And we really, we really want that. We're having those big discussions right now. We can't have that without people from those cultures helping us to tell these stories, right? There's that huge collaboration that needs to happen. But in terms of going into the schools, both as an artist and as a, a performer, um, we forget sometimes that uh, there's so many kids that are hearing impaired. How do we approach this? Uh, I, I remember going in as a teaching artist and I realized that all these teachers have these microphones that they would teach, you know, speak into. And then there would be like one or two of the kids in the classroom that had an earpiece. And it took me a little while because uh, Chris, as you and I know, uh, when we've gone in and done artists in residence things together, we all know this. When you go into a classroom, sometimes you've never met the teacher before. You've never met the students. And so there's a broad range of things that we're, we don't know, you know, education moves very quickly. And so realizing that there were these uh, uh, pieces that we, if we were able to use these pieces as well with the teachers and it could help the kids that are hearing impaired, what a miracle. And so that was a huge thing for me of, of knowing as an artist, when I go in a classroom, I need to look around, I need to pay such close attention to the teachers and the students, not just in terms of, you know, what are we gonna to perform today, but who's in this classroom and, and you know, what, what do we need to do to really fit in here? That's been a long time coming for me. That's been hard. I used to feel like I have to go in and, you know, perform for 45 minutes and leave and I'd done my job and I was so wrong in terms of that. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of disabilities out there um, another interesting thing with the work that we do with arts integration is how do we tell a story that can include a classroom and not just the best speakers in a classroom or that the kids are the most imaginative. And um, so lots of times we fall back to something that we all use, which is the old uh, tried and true tableau where uh, we get to tell a story using frozen pictures. And sometimes it seems very basic 
for, I would have to say 99% of the time when we're using it in a classroom and we're able to teach the kids how to use their bodies and feel confident in their bodies and create a picture with each other without having to use words at first. So nice because all of a sudden this pressure comes off the kids, you know, and they're like, oh, cool, we can make these pictures. And then the narrator comes in and the kids that are good at narration, that unfolds. And then maybe there's some movement that comes in and so, oh, uh, Susie's really good at spinning. And it's this really cool thing that <laughs> unfolds. And so as a strategy, um, I will probably, I hope on my gravestone, not that, I mean, that's a whole other story, but I, you know, I, maybe it should say something like, you know, she ended in tableau. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's something like this. It's like, oh! <laughs> now, I, if I can interject here, Mary, I mm -hmm. tableau is one of the best ways of, as a teacher, to observe and really open your eyes to look at the strengths of the kids. And then from there, you can then pinpoint their strengths and then bring them in. So you're not leaving out that kid that really doesn't want to participate. It might be that they want to participate, but they're not a great speaker. Um, but those, I use Tableau all the time because it really, it's fun for them, but it also helps me to just really be a, able to observe where what these what strengths these kids have and you know and then be able to help them all feel like they're part of whatever it is that yeah. we're doing that day so yeah it's yeah it does seem simple but it is one of i find one of the best tools to use so <laughs> And thank you for teaching Tableau. it to me because you taught it to me. <laughs> I love Tableau. I've never seen kids so excited to be trees before. You know, there's always I... the running joke in theater <laughs> where it's like, I don't want to be a tree in the background. And then you go into some of these classrooms or work with it and they're like, I want to, I want to be the tree. I want, you know, and <laughs> You know, how do we build this environment? Everyone wants to be a tree. Great, we're in a forest. Let's work with that. Let's roll with it. Mm -hmm. It's so fun. Yeah. What about you, Joe? What What's a strategy that you found to um, uh, break down some of those barriers and walls and, and um, really invite uh, students and youth to participate in this creative process? That's a very good question. It, it so depends upon the classroom and the teachers and the students because we go as mary was just saying it's a very similar kind of idea of going from one school to another we do some residencies that are longer like two weeks uh, you know at, in one go and it's you know kind of intensive we do a lot of that we do also a lot where it's just a week it's so very Actually, one of the privileges I think of doing that is getting to see all the different great teachers that we have in the community and the different strategies that they have. So I think mm -hmm. one of the first things you have to kind of gauge is how your students are interacting with their teacher. Because that relationship is a really good indication of how you can go about what you're going to do next. Most of the time, that's a really good symbiotic relationship that's been developed. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you come into a class and the teachers and the, the teacher and the student are really in an antagonistic relationship with one another. And you're the, in, and in that case, you, you've got a slightly different proposition. I think, um, <laughs> you know, we do a lot of um, we do a lot of very similar things. We do. Um, that are tried and tested we we have taken an approach recently which is to break down what we call the five key elements of theater work and to uh which is focus and concentration um body 
and movement, voice and speech and sound and imagination and emotion. And we break a residency down into those five areas for each of the five days. So the first day is working. That allows us to start on the idea of concentration and focus, which means uh, the focus of attention on what somebody's saying, uh, the focus of attention on what you're doing with your body. And so we sort of take that that approach and you build, we build from concentration into body movement most of the time. So we're then taking this exercise. We come up with fun games essentially to start out with before we go into an exercise that's about concentration that's paired with some kind of acting exercise or text exercise or whatever it might be. And then we take that and we build onto it. So we sort of slowly introduce elements into to get students comfortable, especially if you're dealing with something that's like Shakespeare, where there's a language barrier, even to people whose first language is English, there is often a, an instant apprehension about speaking language from 400 plus years ago. And so we have, for example, a variety of scripts that sort of drip Shakespeare's original text into the speech of a student. So instead of coming on day one and we're like, okay, iambic pentameter, bang out a speech and iambic pentameter, off you go. It sort of slowly introduces those ideas into the way that a student engages with the text. So it starts out with character and, and theme and idea and slowly evolves from that into how does this, why does this person talk differently while well, they live in a different time period? And then you introduce more and more complex ideas about language, for example. So I think it's about building, for me, the strategy is building a rapport and a relationship with those students based not on who you are, but on who and where they are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, you can't... I can't go in and be like, I'm an English man. Here we go. Which, you know, uh, That's just always what I assumed your introduction was for every classroom. You tip your hat at them and you say, oh, cheerio. Yeah. I, I, and, you know, I think it's a bit like anything in theater. One of the danger elements of being a teaching artist, I think, that you want to try and avoid one of the pitfalls, I think, is cultivating a cult of personality in the room, which makes the focus of the work centric on what you're doing and not what yeah. they're doing. Yes. And that's and a then, long, and it's a, that's a long list. Yeah. It's good. Yes. Yeah. And that's very true of running a theater too. Like that's another thing you have to be really like anything, like what we do, Mary, uh, as artistic directors, Chris as an executive director, that's another thing you have to be really wary of running a theater, that the theater doesn't become your seen as your cult of personality. Mm -hmm. And right, it's really right. hard as the figurehead of <laughs> well, it's, it's really hard as the figurehead of an organization or as the person standing at the front of the classroom of not, you know, that is something you, I remember from being in school is there were certain teachers who created a cult of personality for their classroom. And, and that the learning became more about their approach to the classroom management and not their approach to the subject and imparting that knowledge and you getting an understanding that's an old way of doing it which is the understanding that you know now we have not everyone learns in the same way you can't right you can't expect you know i had this great experience one, one of the first years first years i was out here in the united states um when my Yorkshire accent was less this is my speaking to Americans accent not my my actual Yorkshire accent because nobody understands what I'm talking about if I speak in my Yorkshire <laughs> accent. Um, uh, but I had this really beautiful experience I was teaching at uh, I was teaching on the native reservation 
and I was teaching this class uh, about Romeo and Juliet, and I had this, I had this uh, really lovely student who never spoke at all. And the teacher had said to me at the beginning of the week, you know, um, some of the students in here don't, can't really read or write. And they were like sixth grade, I think. And some of them like had almost zero reading and writing skills. And so we were doing Romeo and Juliet with scripts, you know, like edited down, mm -hmm. simplified versions anyway, because you can't do Romeo and Juliet in a week, really not fully um, um and we had this beautiful moment where this student who never spoke all the entire year the teacher took me aside afterwards and said that's the first time i've heard this student speak at all out loud in the classroom all all year and what we had was uh one student two students reading the balcony scene and we had her and another student watching it and then acting it out in their own words, interpreting what they were seeing. Oh, and so crazy. she was doing the balcony scene, but she was doing it in her own words, just based on what she thought she could see. And we would talk, we would do the original text ish, the abbreviated text and abridged text, and then she would move on. And, and so it was a, and it was a really moving experience to see this, person just light up and go, oh my goodness, I can access this in my own way. I don't have to access it in the old, in that way. I can do it. I don't have to have the paper in my hand. I can access it in a way that makes sense to me. I love, I love that. that. What and do you I think Ron is thinking about right now? I, somehow I got I don't know what's happening. Sorry. I was I was gonna say earlier that I think um tableau is the theme of quarantine with all of our Zoom meetings and um streaming experiences. Um so um, I want to, sh speaking of uh, quarantine, I want to shift gears a little bit because obviously, like so many things in our existence in our life, um, there was a plan of what this year was going to look like, I think, especially for education seasons. Uh, yay, you're back. Look, I'm back. Um, <laughs> now I'm and, gone um, again. <laughs> and I'm gone again. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, but I think there was this, this this plan, this vision of what our year was going to look like, and then all of a sudden that came to an abrupt halt, and everything shifted online. And suddenly, um, you're having to rethink how you do things. Um, and so, um, I want to start with you, Rod, about what was that like being, you know, a high school drama teacher, and and theater's very physical, tactile, you know, present on stage, you know, collaborative co-creation. And then now you're doing everything online. And what has that transition been like? Um, it's It's been rough because this was not my training, nor for most teachers across the United States and around the world. You know, we're all kind of in uncharted territory and I, I think all of us can look back and say, well, if I had to teach again online, here is what I would do that I could do really, really well. Um, and so I think there's some sharpening of focus about what kinds of theater topics work better through um, sort of a digital format. Um, at first I thought, well, we're going to plow through and we'll just do what we were going to do. We were going to do some student directed one act plays and instead we'll perform them in this sort of zoom like video conferencing format that is really popular. And, um, and as it turns out, that's not going to work for us either. And so um, it's left us offering students based on the standards I talked about before, like a menu of items that fall within different umbrellas of standards. Like some are about creating, some are about uh, responding to work, uh, works of art or whatever. And so they have this 
um, menu. And then every day we would normally have class. I post an assignment saying, choose one of the things that you haven't done yet and do the thing and then share the thing with me. And so that's what we do. And then I give some feedback and sometimes it's a video performance. Um, I had today a really, really great uh, poetry reading. Um, April is, uh, is known for being a poetry month and there are poetry competitions that usually go on at this time. And so that was one of the choices And this uh, student read her poem to me that she just did an audio recording of and it was really good. It was like the highlight of my entire week to hear her do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm pretty hungry to hear them share with me uh, what, what they're up to, but it's really disheartening for them to be in isolation, um, which is um, affecting motivation. And it's really, really difficult to kind of move past that when nobody chose it or planned for it. So um, tonight that we're having this discussion would have been opening night of our spring musical. So this afternoon, a bunch of us in the cast and crew got together in a video conference and um, we were gonna do the Adams Family. So we did the Adams Family oh. funeral party um, so we kind of put in, in a fun, dark way, and a, a few people dressed up and wore like makeup, and it was it was fun. And typically, every year at my school, this is the time where we announce what the shows are going to be next year. And so they've all been wondering for weeks now. Are we still going to know what we're doing next year? So I also did kind of our little season reveal um, this afternoon with them, and it was exciting and it was fun to look forward. I think that's really the key thing is say, what skills can we build right now so that when we get back on track, um, we haven't lost ground that we can, you know, still move forward in some way. Right. And incorporate some of the things we're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love that and really applaud, you know, in, amongst the circle, we all have many friends who are in the school system and all the valiant efforts and, and trying to still engage students and also just be emotional support systems during this time mm -hmm. where there's a lot of grief and a lot of loss about, um, you know, this year and, and all the things that didn't get to happen. So um, really phenomenal because I know you're all trying so hard to keep your students spirits up and and still trying to um, give them the best that you can possibly give them um, during this time it is um it is tough i mean because for some of the students the struggle is is super super difficult in their household with like a lack of income and no food um maybe no access to internet and so it's it's hard to prioritize why didn't you read that Shakespeare sonnet I gave you? And give me kind of an analysis in your own words that's really, you know, in their hierarchy of needs is unimportant right now for some kids. And yet other kids, that's what they're craving. So it's every day, it's kind of like trying to log on and figure out who needs what. So. Yeah, you guys are doing a good nice. job with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know, uh, oh, go ahead. I was gonna pivot I was to you gonna... anyways, cause I know you're doing some stuff. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say um, what I have found in recent, um, just in this last week, um, last weekend was supposed to be my spring um, show was supposed to happen and it didn't. And um, so now we're, we are attempting to do a virtual play reading of it instead. And um, I have ages seven up to 14 in the cast and um, about half of them, um, their parents responded that they're you know, not interested in doing that. So then I had to reach out to, I have a teen program. So I went to my teens next and they all just came back in spades. And what I found very interesting, um, kind of in what you were saying, Rod, is that um, I think some of my younger kids' parents are so overwhelmed by um, school, online school, and trying to teach their kids and, you know, all of that, that, the, you know, what I'm trying to do is just not important. I, they just are trying to get through the day and adding another virtual thing that their kid has to do is, is a little bit beyond. But the teens in my program, they're 
aching to do stuff. They don't have quite as, you know, they aren't relying on their parents to entertain them. They're trying to find things to do on their own. So, you know, my, um, a, my teens just jumped at the chance of doing a virtual reading of a play that they, that is, is quite young for them. Um, it's a mixed up fairy tales story and they are clearly too old to be playing in this, but they all have just stepped up. So I just, I found that really interesting, um, in not letting myself get, um, you know, down because I've been putting stuff out on social media and stuff, trying to keep the younger kids engaged with tongue twisters and dance steps and things like that. And, and actually playwriting stuff and not getting a whole lot of response from it. And, um, I just, I think parents are really overwhelmed with just trying to keep their, you know, kids just in a regular routine to add something else to them is, is more than they can do. So me just being able to let that go and <laughs> not get, feel like I'm failing, um, mm-hmm. by not providing, you know, stuff that they want to, that they're interested in. And it's not that it's that, that thing with some of my younger kids. And even if my program is, is up and running, like it's parents, you have that go between of parents to get in between. And I, I, I do think that's a lot of, of, of what's happening right now is these poor parents and trying to figure out how to do all this in this environment. Right. And time is so weird right now, just in terms of, you know, what's funny, Dave, the other day we have all sorts of interesting projects we're trying to do. And whenever he tries to explain it to somebody says, and we're doing it at a snail's pace (laughs) because (laughs) time is so bizarre. And some parents, are still going to work, you know, and, and Mm -hmm. trying to deal with all of these things. So God bless you for doing it. La Ronda. And uh, (laughs) all those things are good. It's going to be great. (laughs) Yeah. I, I echo Mary's sentiment that, um, you know, I think this is true, not just in, in theater education, but in, in so much of the arts is you, often don't see the rippling effect of your efforts and and the heart that you put out there and and the work that you do and you know have faith and trust that what you're doing is changing lives even if you don't see it even if you um doesn't meet that expectation that we we had in our mind of what it was going to be um i think that's why many of us came into the arts i think that's why many of us became education educators in whatever arena we're in because we know the impact you can have, even if it's just one person and how you can change their life for the better. You're here. Absolutely. Mm. Well, that's all the time that we have for tonight. I want to thank what? all of my I amazing quit. guests. No I know, I know. <laughs> you know, I tell everyone every single time, I was like, you know, an hour goes quickly and people are like, Pasha. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, that's all of our time. And they're like, what? what? Um, but we'll definitely be. This. <laughs> I know. And and I tell all my guests, like, there, there will be multiple installments because I think theater education is such a vast topic. There's so many places that we didn't explore that we certainly want to and need to. Um, so I, I will be having all of you back because I love and appreciate you as human beings, but also as a pillars of light and grace and amazingness in our community and the work that you're doing. So thank you um, so much, Rod, Mary, Joe, LaRonda, you're all beautiful. And I cannot Aww. wait to squeeze you the next time yeah. I see you in person. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
so much. I love you all so much. Uh, for those of you at home, uh, please like and subscribe to Ghostlight TV. We have amazing content every single day. Reno Little Theater is hosting a 24-hour play festival starting tomorrow, 6 p.m. Um, directors, playwrights, actors, you get to stream the entire process. So make sure that you tune in tomorrow to see all the magic unfold. It's going to be great. Thank Fantastic. You. Awesome. Thank you thank for the you, opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Of course. Thank you. Bye. Love you all. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.